Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Samolski, joined as always by Scott Pianowski to continue our position previews uh, for the fantasy baseball 2024 fantasy baseball season. Scott, we have moved on to pitching. Um, we're now we're just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and hoping it sticks. Um, projections over the years have been far more reliable when it comes to hitters um, rather than pitchers. Um, we are going to give you the same kind of analysis, uh, you know, and, and give you the reasons why we have players ranked the way we do. Uh, but this is just generally a little bit of a more volatile position than than hitters. Well said. Uh, this is the nobody knows anything position, right? Uh, my friend Pat Fitzmaurice of Fantasy Pros made the comp that the hitters in fantasy baseball are like the wide receivers of fantasy football, which is I've never heard anybody actually say that before. But they're more projectable, the more reliable, more stable. Mm. And it's been said many times. Um, I've said it before. Sammy Reed on a great Twitter thread that I, I posted today. So check that out if you can. Made the comp of starting pitchers are the running backs of fantasy baseball, fantasy football. That's the comp there where it's like if you get the right ones, you run mm. your league. If you pick the wrong ones, you have a season of despair. Last year, I think of the 13 top pitchers on the Yahoo ADP, like the first three were great. And then there were like seven or eight that were landmines. There, there were injuries. There were there was a suspension. Uh, guys went wrong. Guys went bad. The, the yeah. lists are very different this year. So it's very much a nobody knows anything position, right? He's, pitchers are constantly changing. Release point, catcher, pitch mix. They're getting older. You, you, they're you're working with a new team, whatever it is. And guys break out. Guys go bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you you want to laugh? Look at your picture list from like two or three years ago. It's it's like totally right, exactly. unrecognizable to what we have today. So, obviously, we want to still be smart about it. We want to do our diligence and give people good advice. But this is we're all kind of walking around with our eyes closed on pictures because it's just so hard to know anything. Yeah, you need to really trust, and we'll get to this. But you need to really trust, um, you know, your read on guys and your take on on where you think a pitcher is gonna end up how you think the season is going to go if you have you know analysts that you trust when it comes to pitching you know following along a little bit with with their analysis but you know it, it is harder to just kind of follow general adp because we don't really know you have to really dig into your own views on, on guys um in addition to what you were saying about guys on the yahoo uh ranking who didn't kind of like match up um, as the year went on uh nick pollock from pitcher list also put out a tweet that um 15 only 15 of the top 31 pitchers drafted last year made at least 25 starts uh that means over half of the stable solid foundation guys that were being drafted you know again the top 30 starting pitchers off the board played a full season made a full complement um of of starts so there's a little more risk um so i wrote an article i took this you know premise of are we really without aces right there's this thought that the ace pool uh this year is worse than it's ever been uh given injuries to jacob Degrom, max scherzer brandon woodruff shane mcclanahan sandy alcantara robbie ray you know guys that we are generally ranking within the top 20 usually um, and we know that they're now out at least until midseason. Some of them out for the whole year. Yeah. And no, season, so I, no Shohei Otani this year either. Right, no Shohei Otani as a pitcher as well. Um, so I I took that premise and I looked back at um, the starting pitcher projections uh, for the last four years, and then I also looked back at just top twenty rankings um, based on consensus ADP for the last decade to see if we're really looking at a, a, a diminished pool of starting pitchers. What I found was that this year's top 20 uh, by ATC projections are projected to throw um, an average of 176 innings per starting pitcher. That's slightly down from 180, over 180 innings last year, 179 innings coming into 2021. So we're looking at starting pitchers who are slightly less projectable in terms of inning pitched but nothing really actionable there considering we're also seeing a trend in you know pitchers going uh or not pitching as much um in general They're just getting pulled from games earlier um 
This year's projected wins for these top 20 starting pitchers are right in line with the projected win totals of years past. So we're not really seeing any difference in projected wins or projected um, uh, innings. We are seeing some pretty major differences in the previous year Sierra. So Sierra, most people think of as being the best predictive ERA metric, right? Whatever a pitcher's Sierra was the year before tends to be more reliable in projecting their ERA out the following year. Um, right now, we are seeing uh, the this year's top 20 pitchers have the highest uh, average Sierra of the top 20 since 2021. Um, and that was also coming off the, that was the happy fun ball year. So that's also part of the reason why that went up. Um, and this year's top 20 pitchers are coming off the second worst average Sierra performance since 2015. Um, so that means we are kind of seeing not really the top end starting pitcher talent that we're used to seeing. And also I think bigger for me, this year's top 20, um, <clears throat> the average strikeout rate of this year's top 20 is just 27.9%, so 28%. Um, that's the lowest that we've seen in the last seven years. So you're getting worse Sierra from the top 20 starting pitchers, and you're getting far less strikeout upside in this year's top 20 pitchers than you're used to seeing in top 20 pitchers. Um, and then the last thing was also just a familiarity um, there are of the consensus top 20 right now, 12 of those 20 pitchers have never been in a top 20 before heading into a season. Um, and some of them have been in a top 20, uh, just one other time. So we're looking at only four pitchers in the top 20 that we've seen ranked inside the top 20 multiple times. Um, and so I think that also creates this idea of, um, this kind of lack of this risk added risk is that we're seeing names here that we're just not used to seeing. And so sometimes we can't compute that either a, are they worth that spot or they're not worth that spot, but they're being bumped up because of injury. Um, and so there is, I do find that there is a lot more both real risk and perceived risk in the starting pitcher market this year. So I guess my question to you to just lead this off is how is that impacting how you're drafting starting pitch i mean the thing is if you wanted to just get on base with your draft pick and not have it be disastrous you would take a hitter in the first round which most people do you take a hitter in the second round you take a hitter for several rounds before you thought maybe the risk reward ratio made sense but what's going to happen is somebody in your league is going to draft the al cy young award winner or the nl cy young award winner and even though those guys can come out of nowhere it's the way to bet is certainly with the bigger names. If you, if I knew right away that Stephen uh, Spencer Strider was going to have a full season of starts, or Garrett Cole, which is a pretty good bet with him actually, would have a full season of starts, that would at least make them worth second round picks and probably first round picks in a lot of leagues. So I pivot, and, and I know I'm, I'm using a lot of football metaphors and references here, but this is how I do it with running backs. I want to address other positions. I do not want to prioritize running back. Like we used to back in the day, you get two of them, you get three of them. You, know, yeah. you have to have a running back central centric draft. What my strategy has has morphed into for fantasy football is get one guy, the anchor, the um, the hero RB, if you will, to build my backfield sure. around, and then I'll you know, do what other people do. I'll have speculative plays and I'll work the wire and all that stuff. Now, obviously, you need many more starting pitchers than you do running backs, fantasy baseball, but I want that one anchor. Mm -hmm. I probably won't go after Strider and Cole. And I know this is a two-part episode. You're going to get the, the top 20 guys talk more in detail on the Wednesday episode today. It's more about the second 20. But as far as team building goes, Eric, I would say in my first four or five picks, I'd like to have one pitcher. I probably won't have two. I'm open-minded to it because one of the keys to any fantasy strategy is being fluid, being right. flexible, being willing to pivot when opportunities present themselves. But my general build is going to be that hero starting pitcher. I want a guy... I can tell myself, I can see this pitcher being a top three Cy Young guy or you yeah. know, however you want to measure it. You want to measure it more analytically or statistically driven, that's fine. But I want a guy who can be a, a bona fide ace and then I'll color in after that. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think if I'm taking two two pitchers in my top five picks, one of them is likely a closer. 
Um, and also some of that is just my comfort with the starting pitcher market. I feel good about my ability to identify talented starting pitchers who are going maybe in rounds like six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm happy to fill out the top part of my rotation there, but I'm with you, um, that I want an anchor. And for me, as you mentioned, we'll get to the top 20 starting pitchers on the next episode. So we'll get into who these specific names are, but for me, it's just, I see a lot of um fluidity in the rankings from like starting pitcher five to 10 11 12 and i'm happy in a draft to to read the room and see which of the starting pitchers is going to fall in that general tier and grab a starting pitcher in the back half of the top 10 who i may feel really good about and who falls to be like the ninth pitcher or the eighth pitcher or, or whatever it is. But to me, I'm still getting like a foundational ace, but I'm not having to pay a first or second round pick for it. I might pay into the third round, depending on where my draft spot is. But that's kind of where, where I'm going. Um, Let me piggyback two things on what you just said. One, you talked about your ability, you think, to locate pitchers like maybe that round six to nine pocket, that you you'll be better at that than maybe your opponents will be. One of the things you should do before you start your draft is ask yourself, what do I feel confident about acquiring in the middle of the draft? What do I feel mm -hmm. confident about acquiring at the end of my draft? What do I feel confident about getting off waivers and free agency, knowing that every season is different and there'll be trends that will emerge and there'll be players that will emerge that you didn't see coming and all that. There's always going to be some uncertainty. But the strategy at the front of your draft, to some degree, will be dictated by what you think is available, middle draft, late draft, waiver wire is it a trading leak stuff like that that should mm -hmm. all be incorporated on some level into your draft strategy also my uh, my friend a longtime friend and former podcast partner michael salfino used to talk about hitter rankings generally kind of are more you know clustered and there's more of a consensus to hitter rankings they tend to be more divergence in the middle of pitcher rankings yeah what's going to happen is a lot of your opponents are going to want the same hitters that you want in the eighth round, the ninth round, the 10th round. You'll be getting sniped on a lot of guys, but you might be pleasantly surprised at that middle round target that you mm -hmm. have some of those guys. And again, you talked about round six to nine, people can you know, move those goalposts wherever they want. I think you might be surprised that you get more of those pitchers in those middle rounds. I'm glad you need some guys ahead of them. I don't want to, it doesn't mean sure. you wait until the seventh round to start taking pitching. I don't think that's a good idea, but you know, I've tried that a few times. It's unless you pick, Unless you're the stock picker of the world, you're going to get crushed. But uh, I think you might be surprised because pitcher rankings are more divergent. You might be surprised that you get more of your targets in the middle. Yeah, of the I have. I mean, I have my own rankings, and I will say uh, the top my my updated top 130 starting pitchers are going to be out on NBC Sports on Tuesday morning. So when you're listening to this podcast, they might already be out, so you can go and, and check those. But what I like to do in drafts is I like to look at the ADP the most recent ADP, look at my rankings and just generally map out, okay, these pitchers I like are going in the, in, generally speaking, in these middle rounds, right? I like to identify the starting pitchers that I like, that I want to target, let's say in round six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, just kind of like throughout those middle rounds. And I say, okay, where are these pitchers go? The pitchers I like based on my rankings, where do they tend to go? And then that, and I have that list when I go into a draft. And then as the pitchers get picked, I can start reading the room a little bit and like, okay, are some of these guys going well ahead of their ADP? Is this a draft that's a little bit aggressive in the starting pitcher market? And so maybe I can't actually wait on some of these guys. Maybe I have to draft them where I have them ranked as opposed to saying, oh, I'm really high on this guy, but he tends to fall later. But that gives me a, a, a runway where I can start to see how I can build my rotation based on who tends to be available in a spot and who seems likely to be available given the draft room that I'm in. Um, for example, my TGFBI draft was really low on starting pitching. Like they, they, were, they were hammering bats early and the starting pitcher, the, a lot of closers were going early. So I started, I had a plan for my starting pitching and then I realized, oh, a lot of guys that are, that I thought were going to be gone are not going to be gone. And so I don't have to say, oh, like uh, this ace is still here. I'm going to take him because I know that there'll be, there's very likely going to be four or five guys I like in my next pick and I can get a hitter here. And so you, you kind of need to, to adjust in that way. Um, and I wanted to ask you one last question before we dive into our specific rankings. Um, 
with when it comes to a difference in your style or your strategy of drafting starting pitching between a 12 and a 15 team league. We talked about this with hitters, right? Just like what's available on the wire is drastically different in a 12 team and a 15 team league. Uh, for you, how does that impact how you're building your rotation? In the 15 team league, I'd probably be a little bit more proactive. The idea that a 12 team league would have more available later in the draft, more available on waivers. Uh, pe people also may be quicker to jettison a pitcher that I like because he got off to a poor start. It, the, the bottom line is you're not going to feel as boxed in the 12 team league. Mm -hmm. And you always talk about when people start, whether it's fantasy football or fantasy baseball, people start comparing their 12 team rosters versus the 14, 15, 16 team rosters. You can always tell the difference because in the 12 team league, you should like your team pretty much everywhere, yeah. or close to everywhere. When you get in those 15 teamers, you're going to, you're going to have a belly somewhere. You're going to have, Oh man, I don't have enough speed. I don't know. I hate my bullpen on yeah. the back half of my rotation, uh, the corner infield market, get away from me, whatever it is. That's it's why 15 team leagues are so challenging. And, you know, we're doing the TGFBI encourage everybody to look at, all the great data, any whoever you like, whether it's it's Eric, it's me, somebody else at Roto World, somebody else at Yahoo, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of great fantasy sites out there. You mentioned Nick Pollock, who's doing unbelievable work at pitching list. You can go to this TGI hub and see what everybody's drafting. You're, you're a Paul yeah. Spohr guy. You see every, all of Paul Spohr's picks. They're all in front of you. And every league is different. My pitcher, my league has probably had more pitching focus than yours has been. Uh, so we, you, they're all snowflakes. You have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. And if you'd rather have the accumulated data if you want to aggregate it there's actually a great tab where you can look at all the adps from the yeah. tgfbi so uh so shout out to justin mason for putting this league together it's so much fun to do it at the same time there's an overall component it's basically the fishbowl for fantasy baseball and you know, scott fish is another great person in the fantasy industry but uh, to me it's like you know along with the labor draft that was a couple of weeks ago it's the start of my fantasy season I mean, I, i'm just thrilled that we're we're getting into the teeth of it yeah, it's it's really fun. Um, I I will piggyback on your point about um, the more more pitchers being on the wire in a twelve team. For me, that doesn't change my drafting strategy so much early on in my rotation. Um, like I'm still targeting pitchers I like, you know, within my top forty, you know, starting pitchers or whatever. I'm trying to get as many as I can. Um, with the with my late picks, like when I'm rounding out my rotation in a 12 team, when I'm picking my sixth starter, my bench starters, the guys who are gonna, you know, start as my starting pitcher seven or starting pitcher eight, and they're not they don't need to be in my fantasy rotation from the beginning. I am I go heavy on upside in a 12 team league. I would much rather leave the draft with a guy who has a lot of flaws as my again we're talking about as my starting pitcher like six through eight here but i would rather leave with a guy who has a lot of flaws but if things click he's an incredible difference maker like last year that you know last year for me those guys were zach efflin and kyle bradish who i got outside of the top you know 300 or 275 or whatever who i thought had a lot of upside um and i thought could hit on that upside there are other there were many other picks I had that, that didn't work out. Like I had a lot of like Hayden Wesneski and JP Sears and, and guys like that. Um, but I would rather take those guys than the Michael Waka, Seth Lugo, um, you know, uh, Tyler Wells is a guy I really like. We'll talk about later. But like those safe guys for me in a 15 team league, I think those guys are great. Like I love a Seth Lugo in a 15 team league. He's never been bad. He's never been overly exciting. He's got a locked in rotation spot. He's going to he's going to pitch every 5 days. You feel like that security is something I you really need. In a 12 team league, guys like that are all over the waiver wire. I don't I don't really need to target that. I'd rather target a guy in a draft who is a huge swing for the fences and if two or three starts into the year he doesn't look good, I know that I can get rid of him and there'll be somebody else on the waiver wire who is intriguing to me. Um, and so I don't want to fill my whole team with that, but I do like filling the back part of my rotation with with pitchers like that. And what you just said also applies to, and, and I realize this isn't as common anymore, but if you're playing mixed league versus AL only or NL only, I'm, I'm in the NL only uh, tout wars this year. A floor matters so much more to me in a mono league mm -hmm. or in that 15 team league you mentioned. And I'm so much more upside driven in a um a mixed league uh, where there's i'm, I'm sorry when it's in a, sh a sh more shallow mixed league where 
shoot for the fences, you know, swing for the high upside, if doesn't work out, you're going to have all sorts of pivot options. Yeah. Where if you're playing in a heavy uh, managed mixed league or a mono league, you're not, the waiver wire is almost depressing sometimes. So the floor <laughs> is going to matter a lot more to me. So uh, I totally agree that the, the more shallow your league, and some of you, you know, I played before in six team, eight team, ten team leagues. There's no wrong way to play fantasy. And of course, fantasy yeah. baseball season is open at Yahoo Sports. Go create your league today. You want to play a league in the office? It's it's seven or eight guys. You know, you get the group at the office. You know, you get uh, Kevin Malone and and Oscar and those guys and Creed. I'm sure Creed would play in your fantasy baseball league. Um, also streaming on Peacock, the the office great, great <laughs> series. But um, yeah, if you're in a shallow league, man, just try to hit home runs. And if yeah. you strike out, so what? You're going to have pivots. You're not going to have that in a deeper league. And and I think you and I have to consider floor as we navigate the TGFBI. Although, right. if you're trying to win the overall, you know maybe you have to play a little bit with your hair on fire too if you're trying to beat everybody else. I don't know how realistic that is. And was this league about 500 managers or something like that? But yeah. So you have these are these are season to taste things, and your personality will factor in too. Mm-hmm. As you said, you know, you're confident. There's certain pockets you're confident with your pitcher evaluation. You know, maybe maybe an Eno Saris is in my league who's done a ton of work with Stuff Plus and, and analysis. Maybe he's more confident drafting his pitchers than maybe somebody else might be. So if you have a specialty, you know, maybe you're really good at the closer market. You know, Maybe you've been really good identifying younger players or, or aging curves of older players, whatever like that. You know, in your league, we'll have certain biases. That's all going to be baked into what your draft strategy ultimately becomes. Yeah, you got to do what, what feels best for you and is based on on your skill set. Um, and we will get to some of those, you know, high upside pitchers, uh, you know, safe deeply guys. We'll we'll talk uh, about some of those names at the end of this episode after Scott and I go through um, our starting pitcher rankings. We'll give you some other names to look at. So today's episode, um, as we mentioned at the top, is going to be focused on starting pitchers. We have ranked twenty one through forty. Uh, But before we get to our specific lists, spring training is here. So for those looking to get ahead on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. That's NBCSports.com slash draft guide. And use code baseball24 to get 10% off at checkout. Um, so Scott and I are gonna go into our rankings for today. So Scott, give us uh give us 31 through 40 for you. We'll do this these back 10 first. Sure. Uh Carlos Rodon, tough call, led Major League Baseball in FIP two years ago. He was hurt all last year. I'm gonna give him a pass, although I can't say I'm eager to draft him, but I, I felt like he had to be in my top 40. He's my number 40 pitcher, Chris Sale. As a Red Sox fan, we struggled with the sale that we saw after the extension. He's now gone to Atlanta, the best or second best roster in baseball, depending on how you feel about the Dodgers. So maybe sale is an interesting upside play. Shane Bieber, I have a 38. I probably won't draft him. So many trends going the wrong way, including his fastball velocity. Brian Wu checks in as my pitcher, 37. Seattle, it seems like they're really brewing up some good pitching, deep pitching staff. There's a lot of guys I want to draft at different pockets, and Wu is one of them. Justin Verlander at 36. I think you and I are probably lower than consensus on him. And I think Verlander's been through the ringer enough that I won't draft him proactively. Jose Barrios at 35. I've given up on him ever becoming a star. But a durable, available pitcher in a park that's actually been more pitcher-friendly than we expected. I don't think he's a bad play. He's maybe your third starter. Michael King at 34 was terrific as a reliever last year, was terrific as a starter. He didn't go deep in games, though. How many innings can he realistically pitch for the Padres? That's a question you have to ask yourself. He's a very fascinating prospect going to this fresh season. George Montgomery at 33 without a team, but been a really good pitcher over the last three years. I think he's a safe play wherever he lands. Tanner Bybee, if the Guardians are going to win that division, it's going to be because of their pitching. I don't like their offense, but Bybee's one of several pitchers I like on that staff. And Chris Bassett at 31, he's a boring show-up guy. 3.62 3.62 ERA, 1.17 whips, something like that. He'll win 11 or 12 games. He'll strike out maybe 165 guys. I think he's a sneaky starting pitcher three in a more shallow league, maybe your fourth pitcher. He probably can't be your ace or things have gone off script if he is. But I think Bassett's been underrated. He's had those good whips. He's been durable. He was good for Oakland. He was good for the Mets. He's transitioned to Toronto. I think he's a little bit underrated. I will target him right now my starting pitcher, 31. Yeah, for for me, I have uh, Tanner Bybee fortieth. Um, 
as you mentioned, great rookie year, 298 ERA, but it did come with a 419 Sierra. He had a 20, a sub 25% strikeout rate, um, has good secondary pitches, but a very mediocre fastball. Um, can't argue the results. I have some concerns about the profile. Uh, Brian Wu, 39. Um, I did have him higher. Brian Wu had his real issues uh, with lefties last year. Um, he did start using a cutter more as the year went on, which I think could be good to help him mitigate the concern against lefties. In his early performances in spring, he's not really using the cutter. So I just need to see if that is going to become more a part of his arsenal because uh, he needs something to help him against lefties right now. But the upside there is is huge. Um, I have Shane Bieber at 38. Um, the velocity is actually right now currently trending up for him after spending the offseason at driveline. Uh, so Shane Bieber, wildly only 28 years old. Uh, I somehow thought he was way older than that. Um, in a contract year, clearly trying to get one more big contract. He's flashed 94 um, this spring. We need to see if it sticks. But Bieber has a very long track record of pitching much better at 93 or 94 and above on the fastball. So if that velocity does stick, I think that that's really important for him. Uh, 37, I have Carlos Rodon. And 36, I have Justin Verlander. You talked about that. Those are you know guys coming off injury who used to be aces who we have some concerns about um, their, their performance this year. But it's hard to deny just the general talent they have. Um, I have Dylan Cease at 35. We'll talk about him. It's hard to know what to make of Dylan Cease. I have you Darvish at 34. Um, I think that you know people uh, are over right oh, overrating his career worst year. Um, I just think that he is not really as bad as he showed last year. There's no meaningful dip in velocity. I don't think that age is really catching up with him. Um, he has tons of pitches. He's looked good so far this spring. I expect to bounce back. 33. I have Joe Ryan. Uh, 32, I have Shota Imanaga, who we'll talk about in a little bit. 31, uh, I have Bailey Ober. Um, and so that rounds out my 31 to 40. There are guys that you know we have in common who I have uh, in the next section, which we'll talk about. Um, but before, I you start, you... before you start, let me get the most important thing out of the way. There's about a one-year age difference between Shane Bieber and Justin Bieber, and and I know what a big Justin Bieber fan you must be, Eric. So oh, huge. The, the, the next time you're unsure of the ages of those guys, just remember. But uh, Shane Bieber is about one year younger. That's that's actually wild to me. This is what you um, get on the road, you know, on the road of world baseball. Podcast. Yeah, no, that's this information a huge, you do not get anywhere else. That is a very useful stat. Um, I had mentioned that that we would talk about Rodon and Verlander first, but I think we both kind of did um, at the beginning. It's it's just kind of your trust in or your confidence level in you know their them coming off injuries. Uh, Rodon I think has higher upside because I think you know Verlander at 41 years old is losing some of that strikeout stuff. And as you mentioned uh, when we talked about hitters, you know Father Time is undefeated. Um, The the decline when it starts tends to continue it's just how much does does it decline um so i, I want to jump to jordan montgomery for a second um the if you follow any red Sox uh people on twitter it's the most talked about player ever because some people seem to think that he'll turn around their whole off season um i for the sake of comparison i have jordan montgomery 49th um you have him 33rd so talk to me about why you are so confident in Jordan Montgomery. Well, I, I am a little bit nervous that when he ultimately signs, because it probably won't be with Texas, then the the Glenn Colton and, and Rick Wolf idea that you don't want to chase somebody who big contract change teams. Plus, I get a little nervous, all these guys signing so late, right? I mean, you know, how prepared are they for the season? Not that Jordan right. Montgomery isn't working out, but I mean, there's a bunch of adjustments. You know, your whole family gets uprooted. But at the end of the day, I had to have him in my top 40 because his three-year average, while being very durable, is 3.45 ERA, 1.18 whip. I always feel, when in doubt, I feel better about the lefties. The lefties are just harder to hit. They're really harder for left for left-handed batters to hit. And there are even some right-handed batters who don't hit lefties so great because they don't face them all that often. I realize the breaking pitches move a different way and all that. So sometimes there are right-handed batters who crush lefties. But when in doubt... It used to be, Eric, I, I always wanted a National League bias on my staff because, you know, the DH and the non-DH and all that. Obviously, we've lost that quasi-edge. I think it was kind of obvious, but still, some people just they couldn't help themselves. They'd, pat, they'd pit, 
pick the American League pitchers, and I think you get great values in the National League guys. That's gone. But when in doubt, I would like to have maybe a younger staff, although there are some guys in their 30s who I'm not afraid to draft, and maybe a staff that's more left-handed dominant. And I don't mind if Montgomery goes to Fenway, some people might be panicking, like, oh, my God, Fenway Park, it's such a great hitter park. But there's plenty of lefties who have succeeded there. Yeah, it can, it, it can actually be a park that lefties can – and the thing is – it's a great average park, and it is a good run scoring park. It's not the home run park people think it is. It's a ton of acreage in right field, and, and a lot of line drives that are hit the left don't leave the yard. It's actually not a great home run park at all. But um, I just see three years of consistency. That's the end. That's the end of it. And I realize you know, you, you want to make people laugh, make a pitching plan, and feel like it's, it makes sense because it's going to be shot full of holes. You know, a few weeks yeah. into the season, but. I'm still looking for guys who have been durable. I'm still looking for guys who have been consistent. And I feel like Montgomery checks both of those boxes. He's still in a good age pocket. So uh, 49 for me, I, I'm surprised you were so low on him. I just see a pitcher who is being um, overrated based on a, a strong sample at the end of the year. Obviously, he was very good in the ALCS against Houston. Um, and so I think that has inflated his value a little bit. What I see from Jordan Montgomery um, is a long history of a mid threes ERA pitcher with below average strikeout rates. And I think that that's what you'll get in 2024 too. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I I'm fine having, again, I'm doing, I do my rankings more toward like a 12 team league. So I do tend to side a little bit with, with upside, um, I have no problem with Jordan Montgomery on a rotation, but I think it's important to understand you're probably getting like a 22% strikeout rate, like that's sub 8K per nine, if you do K per nine. Um, I think you're you're getting, he had a 320 ERA last year, but he had a 401 XFIP and he had a 423 Sierra. He's a career 368 ERA pitcher. I don't think you're getting a 320 ERA again. I think, again, you're getting like a 350 ERA pitcher with poor strikeout rate totals and a whip that will probably be around 1-2 because he's a career 121 whip pitcher. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with that. But to me, that's, that's solid and not great. Um, and so if I'm taking somebody like inside as like one of my top three starters, I just want a little bit more upside than that. And I understand like if you're in a 15 team league, his stability is is more valuable. And so I'm happy in a 15 team league to to maybe bump him up from like where I currently have him ranked. But I I just don't think there's anything here that makes him any different than the pitcher who was traded straight up for Harrison Bader two years ago. I mean, that's kind of how he's. That's that was his value. That's his major league value, and I think that is his value now too. Um, and you know, this the death ball like elevated him to some phenom status that I just I don't necessarily think is his true talent. Let me outline one stylistic difference between our analysis and there's no right answer here. Uh, and there's a ton of ERA estimators. Um, you mentioned FIP and XFIP and. Um, there's all the stat cast data and what, what that stuff projects, what somebody's average should have been, what somebody's slugging percent should have been, what somebody's ERA should have been. I have no data to back this up. This is more of a gut feel from playing, but I'm not a huge XFIP guy. Cause what XFIP does I agree. is it, no, takes, I, I fully agree. Yeah. it takes your home run rate and it normalizes it to the league mean. And my idea, especially somebody like George Montgomery, who's been around because Gene McCaffrey would say, we're the young player. Well, we don't know what their mean is. They haven't established it yet, but, when somebody is good at limiting home runs and they're still in the prime of their career, because eventually, you know, guys will lose velocity. They'll start to get worse. And then the ball's going to fly out of the park. I get that. But when I see a pitcher who's beaten his home run rate, like maybe three or four or the last five years or something like that, I look at that as a feature, not a bug. And that's mm -hmm. why this is, you know, as the listener has to decide what metrics do you care about? And, you know, FIP is something I care about. XFIP is actually something I generally don't put any stock in because I don't want to hold the aggregation of the league average and all the bad pitchers in baseball against somebody I think is a good pitcher. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, I am I far prefer Sierra. I don't really use XFIP that much, to be honest with you. With, with you. I prefer Sierra, um, and I also like using um, – Pitcher List has a stat called ICR, which is their ideal contact rate stat. So it's, it adds up the barrels 
plus solid contact, plus flares and burners, which are like burners, like a really hard hit ground ball, which doesn't constitute a barrel because it's not hit at the right launch angle, but it can still be hit very hard. Um, so ICR basically is just like how much really hard contact do they give up? Uh, Jordan Montgomery was at 38.3% last year. The the MLB starting pitcher average was 39%. So he basically gives up an average amount of hard contact. So I look at like a guy who doesn't miss a lot of bats, who gives up league average hard contact. Um, and that profile to me is just a little scary to rank him this this high. Totally reasonable. And and this is going to be kind of double counting a lot of the same data because I know a lot of those components go into this. But if you look at the expected ERA for George Montgomery last year on Baseball Savant, his front door ERA was 320. That's great. His expected ERA per the StatCast data was 3.98, which is, you know, if he gets once he gets over four, it's like, should I even be rostering him? So mm -hmm. I think, and, I, and I'm going to be very open and transparent about one other thing too. When we do these shows, okay, I, after every show we've done, I've gone back to my rankings and I've tweaked a couple of things because you, yeah, for sure. Sometimes you win the argument and I'm like, okay, you know, or you bring up data or information I wasn't familiar with or stuff. You've maybe gone deeper on a player than I have, stuff like that. And another way I tweak my rankings, and you, you mentioned the TGFBI, I, a lot of it is theoretical. I'm ranking players and this is how I think I feel about them. Then you get in the draft and then you find out how you really feel. Yes. That's when you start the rubber meets the road. So yes. I'm just going to be, you know, somebody's listening to the show. And we want these shows to be evergreen. Maybe your drafts later in March. Maybe you're going to draft even after the season starts because we know the Dodgers and the Padres are jumping the gun starting really early. But you may say, hey, hey, wait a minute. I, I thought you liked this pitcher. or I thought you liked this player. Now he's 12 spots lower. And in, you know, a lot of times that's related to injury or there's a major news item. But sometimes it's just a – you know, one of my friends won the argument or I was in a draft and I realized I thought this guy was like my number 27 pitcher. And then I passed on him five rounds in a row. It's like, well, maybe I don't feel that way about him. So I just want to acknowledge the fluidity of this. And plus, there's so many players we're talking about, too. This is a, yes. a big difference between fantasy baseball and fantasy football. You need to know a lot more players and you go a lot deeper. And there's just no time. There's not enough time in the day to go right. to the level of analysis that you've gone to with some of these guys. You can't do it with the whole player pool. You'd never get any sleep. Yeah. So when anybody, you know, again, I, I don't know a lot of you people are going to listen to a lot of our listeners are going to listen right after this pops and maybe you're drafting this week, but you may be drafting in two weeks and maybe you're on a plane right now and maybe you're listening two weeks after the episode and you may see some differences in things that we've said or done since then. And that's one be open minded about where that comes from. Yeah, you never want to dig your heels in too much. Um, I also, you don't want to overreact to some of the spring stuff too much, but I think you want to react. You want to first take note of it, but you want to react also when it is in line with something you were wanting to see from a pitcher and you and you begin to see it a little bit. So sure. like for me, I, I had Bailey Ober 33rd. Yeah, um, I had Bailey Ober 33rd. So I, I was already like invested in Bailey Ober. So me moving him to 31st in my rankings is not, like a major shift. I just, to your point, got in a draft and, you know, I had Bailey Ober after Joe Ryan in my rankings and I got into a draft and realized I was waiting and letting somebody else take Joe Ryan and I was ta taking Bailey Ober afterwards because I just felt more confident in Bailey Ober. And so I ranked Bailey Ober higher. Um, I like the changes we've seen in the spring. The velocity is, is great. I don't know if it'll stick. It's been two starts. Important to understand that 93 miles an hour from Bailey Ober, given the fact that he's six foot nine and has the extension that he has, is really kind of like 98 miles an hour because by the time he releases that ball, how close he is to home plate, him jumping from having a 91 mile an hour fastball to having a 93 mile an hour fastball is basically like somebody going from being 94 to being 98. Like it, it is a big shift. We don't. He, know he's basically he Chris Young 2.0, the, the yes. former uh, right-hander who pitched for the I think the Rangers and the Padres. The Rangers, six yeah. Ten. He, he works for MLB now, and yeah. he did not. Even though he was a giant, he didn't have great fastball velocity. But he's practically handing the ball to the pitcher to the catcher. Exactly. So it it makes up for a lot. The number you you have to take that number. You can't take yes. it at face value. You have to actually tweak it for what the 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 um, practical value of that velocity right. is. And he's never – Ober was never a, a velocity guy coming up in the minors, so he got by on like on really kind of pinpoint command. And so far in the major leagues, his velocity has ticked up a little bit, but he's still maintained command. And if he can show even more velocity with that same command, that makes him incredibly um, valuable. For me, it's also 
I, I liked the pitch mix to begin with. Um, he added in um, a cutter or a harder version of, of a slider, um, which he was trying to f- fill the middle of the gap between fastball and the slider that he throws. And he added in a cutter, which has looked really good in the spring. And I just like it as a piece that rounds out the arsenal. Um, so for me, I was already kind of invested in Ober. I see he's not here inside of your top 40. I'm assuming it's not because he's inside of your top 20. Uh, so I'm just curious uh, where your your hesitation lies. He is. The last time I did my rankings, I, he was in the low 40s. He could easily be. I'm going to have to see how I feel about Rodon in a couple of weeks when I hit into a couple of my drafts. And maybe I could flip-flop Ober and Rodon or you know, Ober and Verlander, guys like that. And I love how you tied him in with Ryan, by the way. This is like the – you see the two receivers on a team that are pretty close together. And you're like, well, one guy's going around or two earlier. I'll let the room have him. And I'll go with the guy, the se- the secondary guy, you know, the generic over the name brand. Now, to be fair, that strategy didn't work that well in fantasy football in 2023. But sure. uh, I like when you can identify similar players, the market's going to price one guy up. And you think, okay, I'll just wait back and take the other guy. I like that. I also didn't realize that baseball savant, has extension as one of the metrics they track, which is again how you, you, you think of Tim Lincecum. What is extension, right? It's a Tim Tim Lincecum is a great example that he had this whippy body, and where he actually delivered the ball from made him more effective because he wasn't throwing it as far of a distance, and that was more torque with him and more mm-hmm. of his body composition with Ober's because he's six foot freaking nine. Yeah. So again, it doesn't make make a big deal that you see that fastball velo ninety one point three percent. It's only you know thirteen percent. Per, uh, per percentile there it's, it's in the lower part of baseball you know, a 91 fastball doesn't get stopped for speeding in today's mlb but the, because that extension is so enormous i'd like to see more ground balls from him it's, it's sure maybe just in my nature to not trust the fly ball guy sometimes that the ground ball has never gone over the fence uh, you can never get a double play from a fly ball you know the traditional double play anyway but you make a good case. I think at the – I'm not going to go to your level of over enthusiasm, but he will be in my top 40, pr- probably in the 38 to 40 range when I redo my ranks. I, I, what was making me nervous was the f- ground ball fly ball rate and just the idea that he's trying to get by with a limited fastball because at some point you fall behind in the count and you have to throw that here it is hit it fastball. And I get yes. nervous when I see 91.3. But I think you make a great point of why over is probably – and he's – He's a little bit of a unicorn, right? Because if I told you, oh, there's a pitcher I like, he's six foot nine, two sixty, you'd be like, what does he throw? 100? 98? No, no, he's actually one of the soft tossers in the league. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But it doesn't mean just because you're a unicorn doesn't mean you can't be good. It's a little bit of a why. I mean, your hesitation on him is a little bit similar to my hesitation on Chris Bassett, um, who I have 54th in my rankings. And I fully admit, like, Bassett is just somebody who I can never i always miss out on and he's always produced but his velocity is trending down um he doesn't miss bats he had a sub 10 percent swing strike rate sierra doesn't love him k minus walk rate doesn't love him he consistently grades out poor in stuff plus he grades out poor in pitcher lists plv metrics like everybody just says this is a guy who throws a lot of pitches none of them are particularly good hitters make a lot of contact um but he doesn't give up hard contact, and so his ratios have been really strong. And for me, it's like that's a ticking time bomb for me, and I feel like there's one season where it's just not going to work out because that contact he gives up that's not hard contact is just is going to be hard contact. Um, and for, for those reasons, I've always been out on him, and I let somebody else take the good seasons, and I understand that that's like potentially a, a bias that's working against me. Um, but it's kind of your same thing where like you look at if I give, if Ober doesn't have the pure stuff to say, Oh, I need to get this out. I'm going to go to this pitch. And I kind of feel like that with Bassett. Um, the last pitcher in this grouping, I just wanted let, to let mention me, let's push back on Bassett a little bit. Yeah, go for it. Um, six straight years that there was the pandemic season and he did, he only made seven starts in 2018, but for six straight years, his ERA has been better than his whip. Uh, than yeah. his FIP, I'm sorry. Or and I'm sure it applies to any ERA estimator. This is I feel like there is something, a reason why he beats his whip, his uh, I'm sorry, his expected ERAs every year. And I again that to me is a feature, not a bug. And he's given us volume, right? I mean 200 innings last year, 181.2 to the previous year. He's won in different places. Even the Mets, the stench of the Mets couldn't keep up from winning 15 games two years ago. Is into an age 35 season. That's a little bit worrisome. But the whips, too, 1.18, 1.14, 106, 116, 119. 
that's where I look at the projection systems and they all have them have a whip of 120 to 125. They're all like, okay, corrections coming for Chris Bass. And right. I feel like everybody's losing at Chris Bass year over year. At this point, I'm just going to say, okay, I'll be the guy who believes in somebody who has beat his metrics five or six years in a row. Should be worth noted three straight years of increasing whip and three straight years of increasing barrel rate allowed too. So trending in the wrong direction, even though the result, I mean, listen, a 360 ERA last year in 200 innings, you're not mad at that at all. And even though he doesn't miss a lot of bats, if he's going to throw 200 innings, he struck out 186 guys last There's year. There's the thing too. Um, if he go, if he get, if he makes those 34 starts, you offset, I, I guess last year was, was in the 30s, 33 you offset that strikeout per nine or strikeout percentage, whatever you want to go with, that's mitigated by the volume, at least yeah. some, I think to a large degree. I, I agree with you there. The last guy um, we'll just touch on, we won't do much analysis because Shota Imanaga's thrown uh, two innings of, of baseball stateside. Um, but just so people understand, and this is why I'm, I'm high on him, because we're talking about redraft, right? We're not talking about dynasty, and I know Yamamoto was the big free agent signing. Um, Imanaga is the one who posted the best stuff plus metrics in the entire World Baseball Classic the last time out. Imanaga had a higher strikeout rate in the NPB than Yamamoto did. Um, Imanaga throws five pitches. They all grade out really well. He does throw his fastball up in the zone, which is great for swings and misses, but also does lead to some home runs. So he does have a little bit of an elevated home run rate concern. But I just think this is a guy who kind of got push to the side because he's a 30 year old left-handed pitcher who doesn't throw you know 98 on the radar gun and yamamoto is clearly uh like a rare talent um but i think that people are going to be surprised at how good imanaga actually is and he's not like a left-handed you know even though he does have really good control he's not a left-handed command specialist who isn't all that exciting like i think this guy is going to be very good for the cubs this year um, and so I, I have him in so many drafts because I, I just think he's an incredibly talented pitcher. Um, and so I, I expect many people to be moving him up their rankings as we go on. Yeah, he's a tough guy for me to to, to decide on. Uh, the throwing philosopher, by the way, is his nickname. He reminds me a little bit of Iwakuma, who was a right-handed Japanese pitcher who had a really nice run with the Mariners maybe a decade ago. But we're also talking about guys 5'10", 175, and sometimes the shorter pitchers make me a little bit nervous. And just the change in culture, the, <coughs> the six-man rotations, how, how does he fit into what the workload will be or the structure of the Chicago rotation? I, that makes me to the point that I know I won't be the high man in Iwanaga, but mm-hmm. I think he he's somebody I've been trying to come up with a – a plan on this uh, this spring and thankfully i haven't drafted that much so i haven't had to really dig in yet but it's possible i could have him in the maybe 33 to 37 range going forward yeah well uh, we definitely need to see more in spring out of him um we're gonna move on to our uh 21 through 30 so who are your 21 through 30 starting pitchers I have Dylan Cease at 30. I don't want to draft him that walk rate makes me very nervous i talk about sometimes the smaller pitchers under six feet make me concerned. That's why I have Sonny Gray at 29, even though he's front of that angelic St. Louis defense. Of course, I, I've drafted a lot of St. Louis pitchers the last two years. It hasn't always worked out for me, but I'll still take my chances with a good defense. Jesus Lazardo, number 28, part of an underrated Miami rotation. Unfortunately, Alcantara isn't back this year, but I don't think Lazardo is a good building block. What do you do with Cole Reagans, who was great for 12 Kansas City starts, but it goes – completely contrary to what he was with the Rangers. It's just so you know, the Rangers pretty much get, got rid of him. They didn't believe in him, and they totally turned himself around with the Royals. I don't really know how to handle him. Bobby Miller I have lower than most people, starting pitcher 26. Huge pedigree. He's still only throwing about 100 innings or so in the majors. I think the Dodgers are going to pull back a lot of times on pitchers this year because they're playing for the postseason. Justin Steele broke out last year by starting pitcher 25. I will draft him proactively. Like Snell had a crazy season. Wins the Cy Young Award, leads the major leagues in walks. He's out of the game so early, so often. Hasn't signed yet. I don't think I'm going to draft Blake Snell this year. And if he beats me, he beats me. Joe Musgrove at 23. We'll see how healthy he is. But as a per start, per inning, per pitch guy, I think he belongs in the top 20. It's just the durability issues push him out here. The Rays, you want to backline the smart teams. The Tampa Bay is a smart team. Zach Athlon had a breakout year last year. I think it's smart to chase him again. And with Yuri Perez at 21, 
He's got the stuff to be a top 10 pitcher. It's just how many innings will Miami let him go? He, he's still in his young 20s, but uh, he's going to be one of my automatic watches this season, and I'll try to draft a couple of shares. Uh, yeah, for me, I've, I've got Michael King 30. You know, you mentioned him earlier on uh, transitioning to a starting role with the Padres. I don't know that we get more than 140 innings out of him, given that he was a reliever for most of last year. But I think they'll be really good innings. Um, I have Chris Sale 29. To me, they're they're very similar. I'm not expecting more than 130 or 140 innings out of Chris Sale, but I believe they'll be good innings. Um I know there's been a, an injury track record, but remember, even when Sale was a, quote, you know, injury riddled pitcher um, and was pitching through injuries and, uh, you know, pre COVID years, he was throwing 145, 150 innings. That is now kind of like uh, the, the standard that we're used to seeing. Um, so that's not uh, that bad of a total. His 2020 injuries for me are, you know, they're not arm related. He had a rib injury and then a fractured wrist when he got hit with a comebacker. Um, so I, I'm not as worried about him having like lingering arm issues. Um, we'll talk about sale a little bit more. Uh, for me, 28, I have Justin Steele. Um, 27, I have Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray, who I'm just seeing right now, uh, left today's game clutching his hamstring with a trainer. Um, hamstring, obviously better than arm, but hamstrings you know soft tissue inger, injuries can linger um i don't yet know any of the details about it because we're on this podcast uh, i'm reacting of, to any pitcher injury that isn't yes. like a fingernail or something i mean i i'm gonna yeah. have to study well, right now let me just be very clear about that yeah for sure if we if we find out that this if that this is actually a hamstring injury he gets moved down because he's not going to throw at all until the hamstring injury is healed um, whether it's a landing leg or a push off leg that strains the hamstring. So they're going to shut him down totally until that's healed. And then he's going to need to slowly ramp back up. I hamstring injury doesn't give me long term concerns, okay. but it gives me concerns that he's going to miss opening day, maybe miss a few starts in the turn of the rotation. So you knock down his innings pitched. I still will like drafting Sonny Gray because I think he's a talented pitcher but I just will probably no longer have him in my top 30 because I just don't think you're going to get as many starts. Um, I have Jesus Lazardo, 26. I have Yuri Perez, 25. Um, we'll talk about him in a little bit. I have Blake Snell, 24th. Um, I have Logan Gilbert at 23rd. I have Framber Valdez, 22nd. And then Joe Musgrove, 21st. I think like you mentioned Joe Musgrove is a little bit of a forgotten man. Um, last year uh, was a little bit of a fluky injury season for him. He dropped that weight on his toe, on his foot, um, in spring training and was out with that foot injury. And then he talked about how he maybe uh, ramped up too quickly um, when he was coming back, really tried to push to come back. That led to an arm injury. Um, I He seems fully healthy right now. I don't care that his first few spring training outings haven't gone that well from a results standpoint. He seems healthy. He has always been like a perennial top 25 type of starter. I expect to, to take him there. Um, just a note for people listening. We will talk about Framber Valdez, Bobby Miller, and Cole Reagans on the next podcast because Scott and I have some difference in the rankings, so they're going to come up on the rankings um, next week. So we'll make sure we get to those there. So just so you know, we didn't we didn't skip over these guys. Let me, um, let me ask you really quickly about one guy we're not going to rank. Yeah, but it's one of the biggest news items. If you're just getting ready to your draft, and you, you, maybe you have you've been on vacation, or you know coaching your your son's basketball team or your, your daughter's basketball team, whatever. So Cody Senga was going to be really high up on my ranking. Shoulder injury, he's probably going to miss anywhere from four to six, four to eight weeks. And my feeling is I don't want to be an injury optimist, especially with starting pitchers. And he was on one of my most important teams. He was a guy who we were going to keep, but now we're not going to keep him. What's your stance on that type of player where it's a major, you know, it's a month long, it's a two month long thing. Do you just hands off? I'll, I'll take it if the price is right. Do you have yeah. a, a comment on Senga? Just I feel like we should address because he's been probably sure. the guy who's moved down the furthest on my pitching board in the last. Well, few Senga, weeks. Senga, and Bradish for me would be exact oh, same. For sure, I had I both can't of them. Bradish. When, it, when it's rest and rehab, well, so, I have to assume that's not going to go well. So I also I have Senga and Bradish right next to each other in my rankings. They're like eighty five and eighty six right now yeah. because they're both kind of projected Hands to off. return around the same time. Um, and they both have injuries that concern me because they lead to larger injuries, right? Bradish's is a UCL. Senga's is the shoulder capsule, which is the same thing Clayton Kershaw had surgery on this offseason. 
So both of them are guys where right now the team's approach is that they're going to come back in late May or June, you know, mid June. And so I will take them if they fall considerably. I mean, we're talking, I just mentioned both those guys are in my mid eighties. They're not really going that far in drafts. But again, if I'm in like a 12 team league and especially if I'm in a league that has IL spots and I can, you know, Yahoo, I'm in a Yahoo league that has four IL spots. I will take a guy like Bradish or Senga late because I know that I'm not drafting them to be in my starting rotation because by the time I'm taking my 80th starting pitcher, I have filled out my starters when it comes to pitchers. So I'm drafting them. I'm putting them on the IL. I am seeing how things go. And I feel like at that point, the risk is not that great because I don't really have to, if they don't pitch, fine. I didn't really take a, a, you know, a high pick and if you do something like Yahoo where you can then put them on the IL, I'm picking up a starter off waivers right at the beginning. So I'm not really costing myself anything. If I'm in like an NFBC format where I have shallow benches and no IL, I, I just can't see myself taking a guy like this because I just think the risk is, is, is too high. Another thing to consider is when your draft happens because those IL spots usually don't get populated until close to the season. And of course, people will be like, oh, "Wait a minute, this guy's hurt. How come he's not in the IL?" Because baseball teams don't have to have an IL; they don't have to yes. maintain an IL yet. That's why we don't have any designations in the game. So, I'm more likely to play the IL stash game if I draft close to the season, where I already yes. know the injury composition of my roster. What did I get invested in? If I draft early, and I guess it could be like if you're drafting this week, it would still be kind of quasi early. I don't know if I may draft a couple of these guys stashing them, and then three more of my pitchers get hurt between now and March. And maybe I don't have enough room for those guys, or I have to hold somebody on my active roster who is hurt for several weeks. So the cadence of your draft schedule will also affect how I'll treat a player like that. Fully agree. Um, I, I have similar upside or similar risk connected to Blake Snell, not injury related, but in terms of my, I just don't know where I want to rank him. You talked about it a little bit before. Um, he outperformed every metric last year um nothing suggested he should have pitched as as well as he did however he has a, th- a 320 career era and essentially a 30 percent career strikeout rate like he has always been good he was never as good as last year i know he's going to be good i don't know how many innings i'm going to get and that's even before he was going to start the season late because he hasn't yet signed i think that you have to take him like we both have him ranked within this 20 to 40 cluster oh actually we both have him ranked exactly 24th because you have to take him at some point he's too talented but i know he's not going to be as good as last year i just don't really know how much he's going to regress and how many innings we're going to get so that's a pick where like i've i have no shares so far in my early drafts because i don't like taking him but i also understand i have to because there's talent there He's such a boomer bust guy. I mean, he wins the Cy Young in 2018. He wins the Cy Young in 2023. He wins ERA titles in both of those seasons. And then he had a six and eight season, ERA over four. In 2021, his ERA was 420. The last two years before this recent ERA season, he didn't even make it to 130 innings. A lot of times when he even makes starts, he's out really quickly because he walks so many guys. And remember, he had that famous World Series start where he was dealing and they they pulled him kind of prematurely. Mm-hmm. I think the mistake is they went to a reliever who was absolutely gassed and the, the Dodgers said thank you and, and took control of that game. But there's a lot of things moving in weird directions with Blake Snell. And so even though I you might say, well, you still haven't ranked in the top 25, I do. But there's proactive picks, there's reactive picks. He's a reactive yes. pick for me. If the price hasn't adjusted, they're not giving me a coupon, a discount on Blake Snell, I'll just sit it out. And if he can somehow have this outlier season, you're back. You know, he won the Cy Young and he led the major leagues in walks. That's so hard to do. Yeah. Last year's workload doesn't line up with the workloads he's consistently had. I mean, he had 180 innings his first Cy Young Award year, 180 innings the second Cy Young Award year, and every other year he's never made it to 130. I'm going to bet on the aggregation here and not the outlier with Blake Snow. I fully agree. Um, we are going to end this podcast with some deep league targets and some rookies that's, that Scott and I are interested in. Uh, before we do, let the madness begin. We are in conference tournament season with college basketball, and Peacock is your exclusive home for Big Ten hoops. This Wednesday, you can start screaming the TIAA Big Ten Women's Tournament, and next week, 
on the 13th. It's the men's turn to get the action started. So turn into Peacock uh, for your Big Ten college basketball tournament. Goodness. Um, so, Scott, we'll just rattle off some names for people as we end this podcast here. Anybody just not focusing on the prospects yet, but anybody who you who we've not talked about in this top 40, obviously, um, who you like either in draft and holds, deep leagues, some guys you're targeting later in drafts. Yeah, I do think uh, Ryan Pepio is going to be trendy, but I still it's just a team that's right so often. And uh, right now he's top 50 for me, but I could maybe see him going up five or six slots as the spring goes along. If, if you draft anybody on the staff, right, Alan Savali I think is a good value. Um, Hunter Brown is a post-type player for me. He, nothing went right for him last year, but I still believe in the component skills that he has, and now that you can get him at your price, he's interesting to me. And also – we talk about later in drafts, especially in the, you know a lot of you are playing 18, 10 team, 12 team. Just get pitchers with upside. If they don't work out, that's fine. Brandon Fat last year didn't work out, but he's a young pitcher. It's not unusual for these guys to struggle before they kind of find themselves. I can tell myself a story where he could strike out 165 guys. That's the type of player I'm targeting for the late parts of my draft. Yeah, um, I like. I actually am weirdly. I'm high on the Red Sox rotation relative to where they're they're drafting. Um, Cutter Crawford, I think, is underrated. Uh, Brian Bayo with the new slider, Giolito increased velocity and uh, a newer slider. Um, I'm banking on a Luis Severino bounce back. He's still going around pick 300. Um, I think that you know he's now fully healthy. Um, uh, Jameson Tyone is another guy. Griffin Canning. They're guys who are going right now like a round pick, you know, 280 to 300, who I think are just kind of like solid guys with a little more value than um, than their draft says. Um, Tyler Wells, we mentioned before, he's in the Baltimore rotation now with with Bradish Hurt. He's boring, but he has he's really good at, co- at controlling ratios. I love him in deeper formats. I think AJ Puck has the inside track to start in Miami, and so I'm interested in him late. And then just some prospects um, I'm looking or younger guys I'm looking to kind of pick up late. I love DL Hall in Milwaukee, um, Emmett Sheehan in the with the Dodgers, um, and Mackenzie Gore uh, with Washington. Um, I think are some guys that I that I'm looking on getting into a, some breakouts for this. Hey, year. Talk, talk you into some Kyle Harrison or maybe a year away. Uh, Kyle Harrison, he's got a new cutter this year, um, or so he says. I'd love to see it in action. Um, so that would be another guy that I, I'd be interested in, sure. I, I will mention also, uh, you mentioned the Red Sox. If I had to pick one of the three guys you mentioned, Crawford's the guy I like. I, it hasn't mm-hmm. been a great camp for Bayo, and I'll admit Giolito was a pitcher I was in love with a few years ago. I've just been a little bit stung by him. But yeah. Cutter Crawford is a target of mine. Certainly he's like a perfect late-round target who I, I don't think – he's one of those guys, I think in industry leagues he's a little bit trendy. I bet in more yes. – home leagues you're probably going to be able to name your price on crawford and i want you to try to go get that go get him for sure um scott and i are going to talk way more pitching on wednesday we get to our top 20 and we will then get to some of those more uh, rookie prospects who we expect to be called up in the middle of the season who we're looking at so make sure you check that out you can follow me on twitter at samsky nyc and scott on twitter at scott underscore pianowski and we'll see you on the next episode of the roto world baseball show